Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to the DAS RCN webinar on DAS and engineering. I am Casey Adderholt, speaking from the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology Operations Center in Anchorage, Alaska. IRIS is a consortium of universities and an NSF-funded science facility operating programs that enable Earth scientists to perform advanced research in geophysics, particularly in seismology. This webinar will be recorded and archived on the IRIS Earthquake Science Presentations webinar YouTube channel. Should you have a comment or question as the webinar unfolds, then please clearly and concisely type it into the Q&A box, not the chat box, on your Zoom control panel. At the end, we'll read your name and question to the presenters. If similar questions have been asked, we may combine or skip them. If the webinar happens to crash due to Zoom or internet issues, we will reboot it. Just click the webinar link again. Use of distributed acoustic sensing is rapidly expanding in our community, prompting the initiation of a research coordination network to facilitate workshops, tutorials, and other opportunities for sharing ideas and resources. This is one in a planned series of webinars on different topics within distributed acoustic sensing. I'm going to pass this to the DAS RCN Engineering Working Group Lead, Dr. Dante Frata now to introduce our speakers today and to moderate this webinar. Uh, Casey, thank you very much. Yeah, and one, once again, my name is Santa Fratton, faculty member at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, we have two presentations today that they are related to the uh, application of DAS to engineering infrastructure. The, the presentations will be by uh, Megan Quinn and Peter Herbert. And I'm going, let me introduce uh, Megan first. Um, before I introduce her, I want to point out that Megan is formally graduating with her PhD uh, in two days. But for this exercise, I'm going to call her Dr. Megan Quinn. Uh, so she's a researcher uh, in geotechnical engineering at the Remote Sensing GIS Center of Expertise at Core Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory that is part of the US Army Corps of Engineers, a research and development center. Uh, Megan's uh, dissertation research deals with the geotechnical effect of distributed acoustic sensing. And her current uh, uh, research areas include distributed acoustic sensing, dam and levy safety, numerical modeling, and data visualization. So Megan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Dante, for the, the great introduction. I'm going to share my screen here and roll into the presentation. And I'm keeping the presentation brief as I hope to gain a lot in the dialogue in the Q&A. So hopefully you can all see my presentation right now. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we're doing at Krell and at Erdic as far as distributed acoustic sensing goes. I just want to point out also that I have some great collaborators down uh, throughout Erdic. So Ms. Jen Picucci, Dr. Catherine Winters, Mr. Josh McCleave, and then I have some University of Rhode Island partners, Dr. Chris Baxter and Dr. Potty, as well as some fellow Krellians, uh, Chandler Engel, Joe Rocks, and some Navy partners. Darren Flynn, Ryan Carlson, and Jen McGonigal. So we are all here because we know what distributed acoustic sensing is. I'm gonna keep it brief. It's just gonna be a pictorial on um, what it is we're specifically testing. Talk to you a little bit about some of our ongoing research objectives, our testing, an overview of some of the results, our preliminary conclusions, we are Krell, so I'm going to show you a little bit about what we've done with ICE and open it up for Q&A. So particularly, we're focused on distributed acoustic sensors buried horizontally in soil. And this, again, is just showing how an impact on the ground surface makes its way and propagates through the soil, exciting the external of the cable, the fiber optic cable. Our objectives are to study the effects of different soil types on DOS response. Um, the thought process behind this is if you're a civil engineer or an engineer in general who's trying to provide installation recommendations, what, what recommendations would you provide? And then trying to assess those options. So it, would you bury it in a sand, a gravel, native material, et cetera? 
how does soil moisture and soil temperature affect DOS response? Um, so we're looking at the long-term viability of these sensors for monitoring. Does, do seasons affect it? How about water infiltration, soil moisture? And the assumption is it does affect it, but then if so, is it significant? Is it something that engineers need to worry about and design around or not? Also surface loading. So as many, as we know, fiber optic cable is buried everywhere. How, if we load the ground surface permanently or temporary, how will that affect how the sensor performs? And lastly, time in situ, as we all know, aging is kind of a catch-all, but it, it feeds back into seasonal effects uh, observed in DOS response changes. And are those effects significant? Can we prepare for them? So again, kind of just going back to that first figure about DOS, a weave occurs, a, a source impacts the ground, shown as a little squiggle in the upper right. And that seismic wave travels through the soil, particle to particle until you get to the cable jacket. And then strains occur from the soil to the cable jacket, propagating all the way through whatever your cable's geometry is until you get to the cable core. So there's a lot going on there. And the thought is that changes in the soil probably affect the signal you receive. So to test this, we installed a new portion of test bed that was spliced into an existing DOS array. So we had a previous install that you can see on the bottom of your screen with the dashed line that was installed 10 years prior. And we spliced into it a new portion of cable, same cable type as the original install. We excavated a trench about three feet deep for fill types that weren't native and then two feet deep for native fill types. Once the, the test, once the trench was excavated for the whole length of the new portion of array, we went back and if we were testing flowable fill or gravel or sand, we placed one foot of fill in those trenches and compacted it. And then we laid the new portion of cable, the entire length from the splice all the way to the end of the new portion of array. And again, backfilled over it um, flowable fill was poured, gravel and sand was placed, native material was placed and compacted. And then we did Troxler testing, nuclear density gauge testing along the length of it and have that data so that we know the placed density and water content. You can see the dimensions of the trenches roughly. So um, bucket width through the whole excavation. And again, the idea was to over excavate non-native portions of trench so that you'd have a good amount of the fill, your, the, the fill under test surrounding the cable. And here is the channel map in two of the locations for which we did testing. So location number one was selected because it's a chance to compare performance with distance the 10 year old portion of array versus a new portion of array, both of which are in native silty sand materials. And then the number two location was selected because it was a chance with distance to compare the response in sand, gravel and flowable fill. A note on the flowable fill for those who aren't familiar with it, it's an excavatable cementitious fill it's often used um, because it's all, sometimes it's called a con controlled density fill. So it can be used because if you're, say you're wanting to expand a footing or the material underneath a footing is poor and you wanna have a known controlled material below that footing, sometimes this sort of fill is used beneath it. So again, we were trying to test common fill materials used in construction. Oh, one other note. Um, the, the source we used is a standard proctor hammer shown in the figure above. And we had several of them fashioned. Um, they're commonly used in compaction control. And we had several of these aluminum plates fashioned. Um, we used this source so that we could you have a controlled source that we could use on many, many, many geographic locations wherever we have fiber installed. This brings into play that we also have a test bed elsewhere in different non-native materials, similar 
lay out similar materials under test, just the native material and the seasonality experienced in that location are different than the test bed shown on your screen. So we're trying to compare the response changes in DOS in different geographic areas with different native materials. But on the test bed I just showed you, these are some preliminary results based on seven months of testing. So SNR was calculated, the signal to noise ratio was calculated in each channel that responded to that impact source. So this is showing you the response to source location number one. Uh, the blue open circles are the response in the newly installed and compacted portion of array and the black diamonds are the previously installed that the, basically the 10 year old portion of array. Um, generally, the new portion of array responds about five dB higher than the previous installation. Uh, and you just see the variance in response. There's a lot of reasons for that, but I think that this generally says that both portions of array, even the 10 year old portion perform really, really well. Similarly, uh, in location number two, we have attenuation plotted over seven months of data collected. Uh, sand and gravel perform similarly. Uh, all three material types, sand, gravel, and flowable fill have similar attenuation. And the difference, the flowable fill performing about 5 dB, 10 dB less than the sand and gravel could be due to the stiffness change between where the source, where the impact occurs, propagates through the native soil, and then it goes into a stiffer flowable fill material before making its way to the fiber optic cable. So we think that's what's happening there. Um, but again, another consideration for if you're installing an array in a non-native material type. Another part of our testing that I alluded to was the seasonality performance of the array. So here's just an example of soil moisture um, plotted over time. We installed Campbell Scientific 650 soil moisture and temperature sensors adjacent to the fiber optic cable in the trench, and we installed them in each material type. So these are the daily readouts of moisture and temperature changes. The orange line is the sand volumetric water content fluctuation. The dashed brown line is the native silty sand material volumetric water content fluctuation over time. The gravel is actually hugging the x-axis. It's down below and it never, although it experienced the same weather, seasonality changes as the other material types, it's free draining, and it never um, retained moisture at the depth of the fiber optic cable. The double black line, if you can see it, is the temperature, the soil temperature. All The temperature in all three soil types was very similar. Therefore, there's only one line plotting soil temperature change over time. The vertical blue lines indicate days on which, in the following slides, I'm just going to show you test data collected. So they're data collect days. And this is the big plot, right? So I think a lot of us who are doing field data test collecting can relate to this situation. Um, the, the markers shown are average SNR on certain dates. We just picked channels in each material type near the soil moisture and temperature sensors and followed them through time. Um, as you see, things were going in a expected direction or a direction in general up until the end of February 2020. And then uh, the pandemic happened and we weren't able to continue testing again until uh, the end of July. And when we resumed testing, we saw significant changes in at least the response in the sand. Um, but as we continued to test, through uh, July, August, and September of 2020, we started to see that response rebound. So the main conclusion of this is there's, there's something going on. It could be seasonal effects. It could be water infiltration. It could be that we had a long, hot, dry summer and the sand desiccated, slightly decoupling with the cable. And then um, with temperature change and moisture change, the sand was able to recouple with the cable. 
uh, lots of unknowns here, but this is just our observations. So the preliminary conclusions are that dossiers work well in gravel. So prior to this, we typically, when we were installing arrays, we tried to remove any larger particles. And obviously the idea there is that you'd cause micro bends in the fiber that might reduce your power. At least for this array, it didn't make a difference. Um, it could be because it's a short array, maybe over kilometers of an install, those little micro bends would greatly affect the power of the light as it travels down the fiber. But for this test, gravel worked well. Seasonal fluctuations, we, we observe changes over time. More studies need to be done. We're continuing to run testing to see what happens next. And uh, as I mentioned before, with the flowable fill going from a, a softer silty sand into a stiffer flowable fill material, that dropped um, the performance of the flowable fill in comparison to sand and gravel, which are similar stiffnesses to the native silty sand. And lastly, just more testing. You know, we're, we're still learning about this sensor and how it reacts to different installation methods and how it behaves in different soils. So let's keep it up. And uh, lastly, from a Krell perspective, in March, 2020, so right before the pandemic really took hold in New England, we were able to install some fiber in a pond, a freshwater pond on the Krell campus. And we installed about 20 channels worth of array in ice. We used a chainsaw. We cut slits in the ice and put the uh, fiber optic cable about six inches down. And then we flooded the ice overnight and let it freeze. And we ran testing. Um, we had some tanks. We were trying to observe both calibrated hammer hits as we did in the field test, but we were also trying to fail the ice and see what we saw on the DOS array as far as response goes or understanding ice mechanics from a different level. We have a publication that's currently in review and hopefully it will come out soon. So with that, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but I would uh, enjoy taking any questions. Okay, Megan, so we have, we have several questions on the question and answer um, link for this presentation. So let me start giving you some of those questions and sure. answer this. Um, David Robinson asked, are measurements more sensitive to soil type or soil compaction? That's a good question. Um, as Because of the amount of space we had available to run our testing, we had to limit the variables we were studying at this point. Um, all of the new sand ty soil types place, flowable fill is poured. So you can't really compact that in a certain way, but it is controlled density. But the, the, sand, in the, gra uh, the sand in the native material were compacted above the fiber. I think generally what you're trying to do is get good coupling. So um, there's a couple, you know, place and compacting soil around the cable would it have good coupling. And then depending on the soil type, there's some direct berry options where you can use like, um, I don't know what the, not it's like a ditch witch. I'm not sure what the non-commercial name is of that, but you can kind of chainsaw the ground and drag <laughs> the fiber in behind you hoping that the soil will kind of self heal and, or you can drive over that, that slit that you created with a heavy equipment. Um, and if you don't have heavy equipment, you just try to do the best that you can to compact behind it. Okay, thank you. So Mike, uh, why do you ask, uh, do you have any details on the table stuff? Yes, um, so we have a publication that that should be coming out through ERDIC soon. Uh, it's also in my dissertation. So you, you might be able to Google my dissertation and find out more about that installation. Thank you. Uh, Min Xiao asked, um, what physical phenomenon or physical characteristic of the soil does the signal to noise ratio represent? Um, so kind of this engineering application, right? So there's a lot of ways you could apply DOS and civil engineering. Some of it is to monitor infrastructure, but it depends on what you're monitoring. 
So from a standpoint of just can what you're monitoring, so a vibration, can the source of the vibration get to your cable? So SNR uh, is kind of backing out coupling in a way is the thought. So stronger SNR could imply if you have the same source, same distances away could imply better or worse coupling. There's a lot of other things going on there, but that's, that's just one, you, you know, we can't, we haven't gotten to the point yet. If you want to study cable coupling that you could go into the field, freeze the ground, take a slice of that, and then study under a microscope, what the little particles are doing next to the cable. So at this point, I think a lot of us are trying to back out what, what optimal coupling is from other measurable parameters. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Joseph Van Tassel asked, uh, where were multiple impacts of the proctor hammer stacked or average to improve the signal to noise ratio for each measure? No. So the idea of this was to have raw, just raw data, process raw data, not try to improve it, not try to filter it uh, from a general DOS response. We weren't trying to optimize anything on the data processing side of this study. We were trying to optimize purely on installation and soil type, or just study that pure effect instead of trying to optimize the processing. Okay. Thank you. So, Yuan Zhu asks, what is the definition of signal, what is the definition of signal to noise ratio from DAS recording? What should we expect of signal to noise ratio with large sand gravel water pump? Um, so we, I do have a couple of, uh, so I'll, I'll start at the beginning. So we use the root mean squared of a capture of the signal over the root mean square of a capture of the subsequent noise, with both of which have the same time period, uh, the details of which are in my dissertation. Um, but that, that's generally the SNR equation we used um, and just kept it consistent through. We tried to find captured lengths that we could use across the board on all data sets and all hammer hits collected, just so that that was consistent. As far as what to expect with larger water contents, um, we were at the mercy of what the weather was and what the soil decided to do. So we didn't get to necessarily in this portion of the study control what the water content was. We were just observing what occurred naturally and observing the signals. Now there's further on testing that we could do perhaps watering the ground surface, forcing different um, saturations to occur. Uh, but I don't think I can speak to that based on this research. Thank you. Uh, Martin Lepos uh, commented you on your presentation. So oh, thank, you. thank you. I appreciate that. So he wants to know if there is a possible drift in the dust recording. Uh, he comments that the graph of different soil types seem to follow the same trend over, over multiple months. I am very interested to see that. I am also wondering it as well. Yeah, so I, I'm interested. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I think any of us who've stared at a lot of raw DOS data see um, see a lot of interesting things happening in those channels over time. If you're not just doing a targeted like capture, if you're recording 20 minutes an hour of data and you just watch what the channels are doing, they do some interesting things. So uh, an anonymous attendee and also Mike really asked uh, what type of OTDR did you use? Uh, I don't know that I can tell you that. <laughs> okay. But I can tell you that it was a conventional OTDR, so it was not a phase sensitive OTDR. We used one of the earlier versions of the, the OTDR. Okay, so thank you. Uh, Doc Miller, hi Doc. So uh, she asked, can you show waveforms? Uh, what was your noise level? And uh, what do you have any ambient environmental signals and instrument noise? Can you comment on all that? I can comment on some of it. So okay. as waveforms go, we didn't process the data that way. Um, there, we have the data, we have a lot of data. As many of you know, it's very easy to get terabytes of data very quickly. 
uh, we had to focus on one thing to process at a time. So that's as far as the waveforms go. Um, can you repeat the other questions real quick? I would appreciate so it. You wanted to see, you know, related to waveforms, related yeah. with noise, uh, and environmental signals. Oh, right. much, uh, an yes. Instrument. So instrument noise, uh, I think we're pretty uh, related to where the interrogator sits. I think we're pretty well kept, like the, the location of where the interrogator sits isn't vibrating a lot. So hopefully we can roll that out as a noise source. Um, both, both settings where we have our test beds installed, they're not in super remote locations. So there's definitely ambient noise changes. We've, we've observed cyclical daily noise changes uh, in the ambient noise, as well as um, like weekend versus weekday changes. To your point though, um, we're also, another thing we're studying is we're like targeting before, during and after significant weather events, because obviously weather events also affect the ambient noise that you record. Thank you. Andres uh, Chavarria have a couple of questions. Uh, he mm -hmm. wants to know first about the special resolution of the interrogator unit and also the optica, optimal settings that are required for these studies. And he has another question later on, so I want to ask you about this question also here. And what sort of bandwidth are being used for your key signals? Okay, I, I'll answer the first two and I'll ask you to repeat the third. So we use 10, 10 meter channels and um, I can, the only other thing I can tell you is that um, we, our sampling rate was 2,500 Hertz. 2,500 Hertz. So, uh, and I guess well, what sort of bandwidth are being used for your key signals? I'm not sure what it means for the key signals. Mm, I can tell you that uh, the, the, the impact Pack, the Proctor hammer was a broadband signal, if that's along the lines of what he's asking. No, I'm not sure. So let, yeah. let, me, let, me, let me go to the next, uh, next questions. And uh, we are going to stop this at, at, uh, at the hour so Peter can start his presentation. So um, he wonders about the reason for lower signal to noise ratio in the older cable. Is it, he wonders, mm -hmm. is it, with degradation of the cable itself? I don't, so there, there, that's a great question. I would like to first say that a 10 year old cable performing like that, that it performed really well for being in there 10 years old. Um, the other thing to comment is we don't have the construction records for that. Um, so it's possible that it wasn't compacted as well. You know, there, there are reasons that, um, that, it mechanically for why it might perform slightly less than the new install. Okay. So I guess related to that question, my way they ask, uh, do you think that natural, there is a natural tendency of a signal to not be to drop over cable length? And how could that affect results? Uh, did I missed the first part. So the signal to noise ratio drop over the cable length? Is that yes. what? Yep. Uh, I'm not sure if she's referring to the attenuation that she saw. It, it, mostly it's just where in the plots that I showed you where the SNR was the highest was where the source was closer to that channel. And as, as you saw the SNR drop out, it was just further away from the source. Okay. Uh, uh, finally, this is for Casey. Bob. If Casey, if you can repeat about where they can get the recording of the file. Absolutely, yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. So uh, then we have the, another presenter, and that is Peter Herbert, and cannot uh, cannot start to comment about how we Peter and I met. Uh, Peter was working with a colleague of us, uh, Miguel Pando, on a project on Jerusalem and Bethlehem. So we met in Old Jerusalem five years ago, and uh, we have a a great time and you know with the world right now we can only think about the the great experience that we have on both sides of the border both in israel proper and the palestinian territories but we met there and then five years later we met again talking about us something completely different but it's very cool to to see peter again so peter is a phd candidate and researcher in the soga research group at university of california berkeley 
and he's also an affiliate member of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. His research focuses on distributed monitoring technologies for civil infrastructure. Peter works on the development and deployment of distributed fiber optic sensing system for monitoring geotechnical, transportation, and energy infrastructure, including levees, ground anchors, roads, pipelines, and wind turbines. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dante. And I will I will point out my, my first experience with fiber optics ever was Dante was doing GPR outside of an old uh, church in Bethlehem. And the GPR had fiber optic cables that were transferring the data. And I accidentally stepped on one of those. And he said, don't step on my fiber optic cables. So that was my first uh, experience. And then ever since then, I didn't know where my life would go, but now it's all about fiber. Um, so uh, I am from uh, University of California, Berkeley. We're situated in the uh, beautiful San Francisco Bay. You, I assume you can see my slide, is that correct? I don't have any faces, but I'll take that as a yes. yes. Um, great. So we're situated here in the beautiful San Francisco Bay area. As you can see, here's the San Francisco skyline that we get to see from Berkeley. And today I will be uh, presenting civil infrastructure monitoring using distributed interferometric measurements. I wanna talk a little bit more about the, uh, the specific sensing technology that we refer to as distributed acoustic sensing, and then discuss two projects of implementation. So first I wanna introduce the SOGA research group and um, our specific civil engineering fiber optic sensing team. We don't only use DAS. Uh, in fact, DAS is a very recent addition our background is in distributed strain sensing using Brion um, based technologies, which I'll talk just slightly about in a few minutes. But this is our team. It's led by Professor Kenichi Soga, as well as Professor Matt DeYoung, both moved from the University of Cambridge um, about five years ago or so, and have assembled um, quite a large group here. And now uh, also have a presence at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, as uh, Dante mentioned. So what is our background? What, what does this group do? Well, we monitor civil infrastructure. And it, it, as simple as uh, that is, there's a lot of facets to that. So in the top left, you can see a project monitoring uh, Liverpool Street Station um, cross rail tunnel, where one tunnel is being constructed to intersect another in London. And we measure the, uh, the deformation in this tunnel based with fiber optic sensing. We also, uh, this is very recent, just in the last couple of months, have done some foundation monitoring for a mysterious San Francisco high rise. I can't tell you which one that is, but you could probably figure, figure that out yourself. The, um, we also do some monitoring of natural gas infrastructure for the California Energy Commission. Here's a, a test specimen of a natural gas uh, pipeline T joint that, that's undergoing a lab test. We work with the US Army Corps of Engineers extensively as well. I was actually in a separate meeting yesterday with Meg. Uh, well, this is here is a, a levee where we're monitoring uh, in Sacramento the levee cutoff wall using uh, distributed strain sensing and some distributed acoustic sensing as well. Uh, we also look at things like retaining walls and ground anchors. You can see there's a lot of dirt here. There's a lot of soil. Our background tends to be in soil mechanics. Also, we have a laboratory facility where we test large scale buried pipelines. Uh, this facility simulates earthquake shearing uh, and used to be at university uh, used to be at Cornell University. Um, but is now being moved to Berkeley where we're building a smart infrastructure center in Richmond, California. So uh, enough of the introduction, I'm gonna get into what distributed fiber optic sensing is from a holistic point of view. Um, I know many people on this call are expert in distributed acoustic sensing, but again, I like to look at it from a little bit of a higher vantage point. So what is distributed fiber optic sensing? Well, it's sensing that relies on a fiber optic cable and backscattered light that is originated from an interrogator unit in an incident pulse, interacts with the fiber and scatters off of inhomogeneities, changes in the waveguide geometry and various just um, heterogeneities in the fiber to scatter light back towards the source. And by looking at light that's scattered back towards the source, we can look at things like temperature, we can look at static strain, we can also look at what you know we can refer to as vibration or acoustics, but uh, I hope that after my talk today, I can convince you that it's really no different than the other things that we can measure in terms of strain. Um, so the type of light that pro the properties depends on the sensing technique. So that means that there are different types of light that scatter in the fiber, which I'll talk about. And uh, they're also analyzed in different ways. The different kinds of light that are used in distributed fiber optics sensing are Rayleigh, Brion, and Raman. Probably heard these terms before. Rayleigh is what we're all about here in distributed acoustic sensing. 
It's also used in other types of distributed strain sensing as well and distributed temperature sensing. Rayleigh kind of is a, uh, a jack of all trades. You can do pretty much everything with Rayleigh scattering one way or another. Brion is a, a very useful scattering type for looking at absolute strain and absolute temperature change because uh, they act actually uh, physical properties in the fiber change. So you can disconnect an interrogator unit, look at a fiber, then look at it 10 years later and see the absolute strain change over that time. Uh, in in Rayleigh-based systems, we're going to use interferometry and distributed acoustic sensing in order to make meaningful uh, observations about our system. And I'm going to talk about how that's done now. So you may notice that this figure right here is your classic Michelson interferometer, if you have a, an optics background. Um, what, a, what a Michelson interferometer is, is it takes a coherent light source, splits it into two parts, and then recombines it, interfering those two light beams at a detector. And what's being measured is the interaction of those two light beams with each other, their interference. That's described here by I. I is intensity. And as you can see, it's the square of the sum of two uh, electromagnetic fields being summed together. An electromagnetic field with the uh, amplitude of E1 and E2, and this phase term of this complex exponential multiplying uh, that amplitude. So this is in terms of a classic lab setup Michelson interferometer. This is in the setup of, uh, of a intensity only gas interferometer. Um, so this is the, the older technology that Meg talked about a little bit. And it's basically the same exact thing. Instead of mirrors, we use fiber couplers. You know, our, our group does build our own uh, interrogators. We don't build DAS interrogators, but we build, build Brion based interrogators. So I like talking a little bit about the specifics of it. So rather than a mirror, we have a fiber coupler that splits light apart, sends it into a sensing fiber. It reflects off of an inhomogeneity, which is now the mirror. So our mirror is now an inhomogeneity. It comes back, gets combined back together, which is what ha is happening on this side of the mirror, and then hits the detector. What does that look like on the right? In an intensity only system, this is why it is an intensity only system, we do not know what our initial phase difference is between our light. Our initial phase difference could be zero or it could be pi over two. These are, these are two extremes. It also could be anywhere in between or outside. When there's no phase difference between our, our backscattering light and our coherent incident light, and we modulate that with a phase signal, which is our displacement or our strain on our fiber, we get this signal. If our initial phase bias is pi over two, we get this signal. They're both from the same input. So this is why it's, it's considered an intensity only uh, interrogator unit, because what are we looking at? We're really looking at disturbance that's happening on the fiber. It's very difficult to make any kind of meaningful uh, strain-based um, observations with this technology. Then we jump forward to the next generation, which is quantitative DAS units. These are things like the um, the OptiSense ODH4 and 5, the Selixa IDAS, the Helios Theta, um, many other, the, the Phoebus Optics uh, has, has one as well. So does Aragon Photonics. There are many now that are in the market. And what's going on here is rather than having our, our, our random phase bias that we don't know, we add a known modulation to one of our sides, which is basically saying we're going to absolutely know what our phase difference is between our sensing leg and our reference leg. So in our interferometer, we're now taking multiple measurements to make one phase observation. And we can reconstruct the exact phase signal that's acting on our fiber because of this known phase modulation. This is only one possibility. There are also many other uh, specific designs. And I, I made this so that it's based on no commercial product. Uh, it's just a, a theoretical standpoint. And, and over here is some math. What we're trying to back out, you can look at this later if you're interested, we're trying to back out this phase change, K phi T. And our phase change is this phase modulation that I'm talking about. What kind of change in the interferometer are we actually having? And why is that important? Because that is linearly related to fiber length change. So phase is linearly related to distance. Therefore, phase change is, is linearly related to distance change, which can be converted to strain. So what do we have here? We have our fiber length change 
is our distance per radians in an axially strained fiber. So wavelength, which is in units of distance, two pi. So you can see that there's units of radians in the bottom. This is a scaling factor for the material of, of glass, the material of fiber optics that's being axially strained. And this is our externally applied phase change. Our external, externally applied phase change must be divided by two because our light goes forward and it also comes backwards. So it experiences this phase change twice. So as you can see, I hope I've convinced you that our phase change that we impart on our fiber, we impart on our interferometer is actually a length change. And we can easily divide by what we call our gauge length to get strength. This is also laid out in a publication, Seafoam MSP02. I highly recommend you look at uh, what this is. It's a, it's a uh, standardization for quantifying gas sensor performance and what specifically is being measured. Okay, the math is uh, out of the way, thank goodness. Let's talk a little bit about some monitoring and some ways that we can use that science, we can use that specific sensor technology to make meaningful observations about a civil system. And uh, one thing that's very important when we look at civil systems, which is different than geophysics, uh, geophysics, for the most part, what we care about is waveforms and we care about uh, things like the, the geometry of our waveform. In a civil system, if we want to monitor strain, which is what I'm specifically talking about, we care about the amplitude. And we care about the mechanical transfer of our system to our fiber core. So as Meg pointed out before about, about the bonding and the coupling, that's extremely important. So we use a tightly bonded fiber optic cable uh, that is, we've tested at length and we feel very confident that the strain that is imparted to the outside sheath is also imported, imparted to the fiber core up to about 1% strain. So what I'm, gonna, uh, uh, what I'm gonna present here is work from this publication here on monitoring a model wind turbine tower with distributed acoustic sensing, excuse me. So what is the issue that we wanna address? That's always the most important thing. Wind turbines are costly to inspect. We work with this Italian power company called NL. You may have heard of them. They have a branch NL Green Power that's interested in explosive growth. They're buying wind, wind farms all over the world. And about 10% of their operational expenditure for wind farm is tower inspection and bolt tightening. So we wanna look and see if we can address this and also address the fact that wind farms are very large and spread out. And it would be really nice to have a centralized solution where we can have one data center and we're collecting data and information about all of our wind turbine towers. So we, we tested a concept of using different types of fiber optics uh, with this laboratory test at PEER, uh, which is the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center in, in Richmond, California. And we constructed a specimen tower with very similar dynamic properties to a full scale wind turbine tower and we instrumented it using fiber optics. So you can see these fiber optic cables that are being epoxied to the outside of this wind turbine tower. And we also had a vibration generator at the top. Um, it, it, a little bit overkill. This was actually used for shaking dams and getting the, uh, the, the vibrational characteristics of dams. But if you're gonna do it, you might as well go all the way. So we, we put a big vibration generator on the top of this tower. We instrumented the tower using two of these tightly buffered fiber optic cables where we implemented um, DAS using an OptiSense ODH4 Rayleigh-based distributed acoustic sensing. We also used uh, a Luna Innovations Odyssey 6000, which uses a technique called OFDR or op opto optical frequency domain reflectometry, which I don't wanna get into the specifics of, that could be another topic of its own. But what I want you to know about this Odyssey 6000 is that for strain measurement, it is a proven solution. Uh, it is used in automotive crash tests, uh, in the aeronautics industry. Uh, it is a very proven solution and a commercial product that has been on the market for uh, at least four commercial product generations. Uh, meaning product generation, so product iteration. So it's a very mature technology. We also instrumented this, tech, uh, this, this tower with accelerometers, as you can see, to verify some measurements. So first I wanna show you our control. So our OFDR, that technology that we really trust. When we push the tower 
to the north, and we let it oscillate north to south, this is the kind of strain spatial profile that we see. We see concentration of strain that is localized at the specific joints. It actually makes a lot of sense. That's where the weakest points in the tower are. You have welds at that location, you have bolts at that location, you have flanges. You expect it to behave differently. And that's exactly what we see. We see localization of strain at the flange locations. This system has a very high spatial resolution, 2.6 millimeters. That's why this data looks so dense. Every 2.6 millimeters, we have data. It's a really nice control data set. Short measurement distance, we can only measure over 50 meters. So this is where DAS comes in. We want to push that length out to a reasonable range for a full wind farm. So with OFDR, we can see dynamic strain both at flange locations and away from flange locations. At flange locations, we can see a strain amplitude beginning at around 500 microstrain and damping out. So we can see dynamic strain of the tower structure can be measured, natural frequency, damping, and deformation localization are also clearly observable. So what we see here is we see two spikes. These actually correspond to north-south and east-west natural frequencies. Uh, the tower was stiffened asymmetrically. So we see two natural frequencies of vibration. All right, now let's get to what we are really interested in, distributed acoustic sensing. So with that same cable that's epoxy directly next to the OFDR cable, these are the kind of waveforms that we get out. If we look at one channel that's on the north side of the tower and one channel that's on the south side of the tower, we see a very beautiful 180 degree out of phase amplitude matched waveform. Nice, that's exactly what we hope for. When there's tension on one side, there's compression on the other side and vice versa, right? But why is this value different? You know, why are we seeing 500 microstrain as opposed to 500 microstrain, which we were seeing with OFDR? I hope to uh, convince you of why that is the case in a few minutes. One thing we can also do is we can pick out these natural frequencies with a extremely low noise floor as compared to OFDR. The noise floor is uh, absolutely phenomenal. So we could pick out the natural frequencies of the tower with DAS by just pinging it with a finger. Just hit it, take a look at what the frequencies are and you can see the natural frequencies pretty easily. So how do we get OFDR and phase OTDR or DAS on the same page? We wanna compare these two, these two things. One we trust, one we're not so sure we trust yet, and we wanna compare them. This is how that's done. So with, with OFDR, we utilize the Rayleigh backscatter spectrum, which you don't need to care about, which is linearly related to strain. So our measurements are already in strain. We have strain. So one thing uh, from, from structural mechanics, if you've had some background there that you can uh, recall, is that if we integrate strain, we can get displacement. We can get axial elongation with an integration of strain. So what is this? This is the trapezoidal rule. This is numerical integration. So we integrate strain and we get displacement. With phase OTDR, I already showed you the equations for how do we get a change in displacement over one channel or over one gauge length, I should say. If we sum our changes in axial elongation over one side of the tower or sum up the tower and get U of N, our displacement field, we're now in the same units. We're now speaking the same language. Because remember, strain is relative to your reference. So if you have a system that's reference is 2.6 millimeters, that's delta L over L, right? Change in length over length. And your length is extremely small, which means your strain is going to automatically be really big. Even though strain is unitless, my strain and your strain and Dante's strain, they may be all completely different because our L is different. We're, we're normalizing by a different factor. So in order to compare, we need to get out of strain and we need to get towards displacement in this case. So if we look at axial displacement and we compare OFDR versus phase OTDR or uh, DAS, we see this pretty perfect match. We're slightly lower in amplitude by about four to 5% on the DAS side. We feel very good about the way that these measurements are, are corresponding to the same physical phenomena. Now remember with fiber, we're making a measurement over a one-dimensional 
geometry. And then we have time. So we can actually express this in three, dim three dimensions. So three dimensional plots are always really confusing. So I'll take a, a, a few minutes to, to talk about this plot, but if it's still confusing you, I'm sure you'll have access to the slides and you can take a look at it later. But what we're looking at is we're looking at distance along our tower, we're looking at time, and we're looking at displacement. That displacement is in the axial direction of the tower. Now, we're looking at the envelope of the previous plot. So if you take this waveform and you take the exterior, the envelope, so you just trace the envelope on the top, that's what we're showing here. With OFDR, what we're getting when we look at displacement is we're getting what looks like a surface here because the, the points are only 2.6 millimeters apart. With DAS, in this specific system, we have a channel every one meter. So our, our data points are one meter apart. So remember, this is where the lab scale becomes a problem. We're only talking about a, a little over six meters for a tower, but in real life, hub heights are up to 100 meters. So as, as you get more and more channels, these blue lines get closer and closer together and seem more and more like a surface. So this OFDR is a really nice tool for verifying lab scale measurements, whereas DAS is much more realistic for field scale measurements. So on the right, you can see cross sections of this three-dimensional plot, and you can see how individual DAS measurements match our equivalent displacement measurements from OFDR very well. And remember, our displacement is localized at our flanges. So that's what these jumps are. So NL is, is currently planning with, with Berkeley to do a full implementation on two wind turbines in Oklahoma over the next year where we're, we're gonna be deploying DAS to monitor those tower structures. So I will, um, I'm, I'm running a little short on time, so I'm gonna get moving towards the, the, the next project, which is a little bit more fun and a little bit less technical, so it should go by faster. Here's the concept on the left. The idea is, is how do we make a road like a touch screen? Right. So before, when you had a, a phone, it was a BlackBerry right before the iPhone, right? And you had a screen part, and then you had you had to interact with the phone through a keyboard and, a, and, a, and a, some kind of ball or something, joystick or something like that. Well, our roads right now are completely passive, like the screen of a BlackBerry was before it was touch screen. We want to make it into something that can actually make observations about itself. So here's the concept. We have a road and we embed our tightly uh, buffered fiber into the road. We acquire data at this node and we transmit some kind of information to our car. And our car could be autonomous, it could not be autonomous. It could just have a display that tells you things. And the car knows that there's a dangerous blind situation here with a bicyclist and a semi that's crossing over the double lines. That's the concept, keep that in the back of your mind. So on the right, we have our field implementation to test this concept. We have, uh, here's a road before installation. We put over a kilometer of fiber, it's research. So this is not, not, not supposed to be practical. Um, we put over one kilometer of fiber optic cable uh, actually into the pavement and then paved over top of it to create what we call a smart road. And, and by, this, is, this work has been submitted um, for publication. So here's the geometry of where these cables are. We know DAS can go much, much farther than OFDR. We just talked about that. So we have one 40 meter long OFDR cable, but we have um, you know, something like 900 meters of DAS cable into this road. And you can see it's 3.175 centimeters below the surface of the road after paving was complete. Here's the process. We marked our lo location of the cables, use a pavement saw to cut grooves, laid the cables into the pavement itself, capped over those grooves with a mixture of asphalt emulsion and sand, and then uh, just told the, the paving crew to, to have at it their normal process, and they paved this road uh, as normal. Well, we had the cables there, so why not do some monitoring during construction? This isn't the main point of this uh, project, but I thought this was pretty cool. We're looking at a frequency band extracted data set, a waterfall, of the specific paving process that happened. So the first thing that happened was an asphalt truck back down the road. And we can see on our multiple DAS lines, here's our pavement truck backing down the road. The pavement truck then dumped asphalt into the, this yellow paving machine and the yellow paving machine advanced along the road, which is shown in pink. And then as it advanced along the road, 
our vibratory roller went forward and backwards, forward and backwards, vibrating intermittently. And we can see the behavior of the vibratory roller as well. So, and I want you to remember this is simultaneously happening. So as paving is happening here, we can see where things are happening in other locations of the road. Pretty cool. So here's a test set. We took a Ford F-350 and drove it along the smart road to see what would happen, see what we could measure. Looking at OFDR and DAS, uh, here are our, it's sort of similar. You can see those individual points that are associated with DAS and a line associated with OFDR because the measurements are so close. We're showing this spatially. We have a tensile and compression zone associated with each axle of our truck. And one thing we notice is that our DAS measurements follow the trend very well. The only difference, which is a bit of a bummer, is that the DAS cable is 40 centimeters outside of the axle and roads are not um, uniform stiffness. They actually decrease in stiffness towards the edge of the road. So this is the least stiff part of the road and it continues to increase to the most stiff part, which is at the crown and then the least stiff part again. So the most comparable is this 40 centimeters away uh, from this OFDR cable. So we can see slightly less, uh, but what we're doing is we're, we're uh, I showed you how to get them in the same terms for displacement. We can also divide that displacement by the same number and have the same type of strain. And that's what we're doing here. We're converting everything to displacement and then we're dividing by a normalizing factor, uh, which is back into unitless, which is back into a strain. Um, so we're in a two meter uh, strain measurement here. This is what it looks like in terms of an image. So you can see strain with time and you can see OFDR and then DAS at a two meter gauge. So like I said, we look at the displacement, we divide that by two meters. And this is what we get. So pretty nice, we see strain right around three to four micro strain in compression happening right underneath the wheels in the pavement. The resolution is better here because again, we have 2.6 millimeters as opposed to, to uh, one meter. So, okay, that's our test, our verification. We feel good that OFDR and phase OTDR are measuring the same thing. Let's do some test cases now. So the first one is the truck driving at four and a half meters per second. You actually already saw the data set for this one. Unfortunately, my drone died and I was running on the road. So sorry about that short one. Didn't die again though. Here's a pedestrian. It's also just me, by the way. Cyclist. My personal favorite, my puppy Gia. Okay, let's look at the data sets associated with this. So with the runner, we can see independent impulses focused on compression underneath the footfall of the individual with tension radiating away spatially. And we can see these impulses because you know, when you run, you're not in contact with the ground at all the time. So we have a pause and in between where we don't have any contact with the ground. We're creating between um, 0.4 and 0.5 micro strain of compression. Now we look at pedestrian. We always have foot contact with the road. So we always have a compression and a tension component at all times with a different geometry. Here we're at about, this is 300 nano strain of compression. Here we have a bicyclist. Now notice the gauge length effect. So our axles are actually closer together than our gauge length is. So the compression from these axles, I feel, is smushed together in this one compression, uh, this one compression signature. These are only about a meter apart. We're running a two meter gauge length on the system. And here's the, uh, the grand finale. We have Gia, who at the time was six, uh, she was just over six weeks old, actually. And um, sorry, just over six months old. And she weighed about 30 pounds. 
And this is the strain that she caused on the road in the, in the, in the neighborhood of 25 nano strain. We can start to see the noise floor coming into view, uh, but we haven't reached it yet. We can still see uh, you know, a, a dog running, not even on the cable. It was very hard to keep her on the cable location. She's more in the middle of the road, but we can still see location. Here is the, uh, the distribution of different strains on a log plot. Here's what we think the noise floor is based on some observations we made of the, the time series data. And we're not even coming close yet. So I went a little bit over, but that's all folks. There's the, the punchline. Uh, this work was done using an OptiSense ODH4 interrogator unit. I would like to give a special thanks to Chris Minto and Martin Karenbach of OptiSense for supporting the work. They provided invaluable technical guidance and equipment support. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much. So we have a few questions. Uh, the first one is from Chao Wang. Uh, these questions came early in the presentation and he asked, how do environmental noise and vibration affect the dust signal? Uh, was environmental noise removed from the data shown because they, the data looks so clean? So there are a few sources of noise that we deal with when dealing with DAS data. One of the most common is laser drift. So lasers are an internal chamber that have a resonation of an electromagnetic field. And as, that, as the temperature of that internal cavity changes, the wavelength of the laser linearly changes as well. So always in raw uh, phase OTDR measurements, we see a trend, a drifting that happens in our time series. And that's due to laser drift. So there are techniques to get rid of laser drift from the interrogator point of view. But for this study, I just used a bandpass filter and filtered above that very, very low frequency noise that comes from the instrument. In terms of environmental noise, this is only a subset of the studies done. We also did a load of geophysical experiments on things looking at ambient noise tomography um, and such where we did notice significant noise associated with the train. There's a train that's not too far away from this location at Richmond Field Station, uh, as well as even planes flying low overhead. You could, you could specifically see, I could even see my drone when I flew my drone very close to the road. But from this, uh, the data sets that you saw here, uh, environmental noise was not targetedly removed. If it was removed by the bandpass filter that was eliminating the, the uh, phase drift, um, then, then it helped. But I didn't specifically do that, no. So the next question is by Nate, Nate Lindsay. Uh, by the way, OK, so please keep, keep bringing questions to the, uh, to the question and answering uh, option here. So Nate asks, uh, he, he says first, Peter, excellent. And then he has a question. Uh, during the cyclist trial, he spotted a pedestrian walking in the opposite direction of the cyclist at a greater distance from the road. Do you see the pedestrian at this offset? Yeah, that is a very nice spot. So the, um, the trench, let me go back. So there's a road and there's actually, I didn't mention it in this presentation, but there's also a trench. Um, so you can see where the ground has been disturbed right next to the road. That's because fiber wasn't only installed in the asphalt, that actually we have three different depths where we have four different types of cables installed in this trench. And as Ronan, uh, who's my colleague, was walking along the road, inside the pavement, we noticed that the pavement did an amazing job at, uh, I'm not gonna say damping out, but there's such a stiffness impedance from the road material to the soil material that vibrations in the soil do not easily penetrate the stiff material of the road. So that's the short answer. The long answer is that in the cables that are in this trench, you could independently see the pedestrian moving on the edge of the road. So if we have a road and then we have a sidewalk or we have even just a dirt path next to it, we can differentiate between something moving on top of the pavement and something moving on the road because the road doesn't pick up the person in the, uh, on, on the side, but vice versa is not true. The cable in the trench obviously detects the truck as well. So one minus the other, uh, we can see where a phenomenon is happening. So it's, it's, it's really fun to look at those things. 
So Nate has another question that is not really task related, but he wants to know what was the height of the drone? Yeah, you can see the drone. <laughs> okay, I'm a bit of a no, drone. No, at, what, at what height can you see the okay. drone? Yeah, okay, yeah. So I'm a bit of a drone enthusiast. So my, my, my reverse question would be which drone? So the Mavic Mini, um, I could get, you know, maybe two feet. But then I also have an Air 2, which is a bit bigger and a bit louder. And that one I could see up to about maybe mid chest height. See in the DAS. Yeah, I, I yeah, understood. So it's which one? If you have a, a Mavic Pro or something like that, maybe it's even higher, but I don't know. Uh, Amara Shamari asked, uh, can you calculate car speed from the last plot that you show in your, in your nice presentation? Yes, absolutely. You can you can calculate uh, you can calculate the speed behavior. Um, you can calculate uh, the, the the changes in speed. So you can calculate acceleration uh, very well. You can see um, all sorts of different phenomena. Even the the, the challenge with DAS uh, for this application being completely transparent is that when a vehicle stops, you have a certain amount of time where you can see that very well. But because we filter out the very low frequencies, we asymptotically approach static strain when we stop a vehicle. So we can see that the vehicle has stopped, but then after they stop for about 10 seconds, you know, talking about uh, 0.1 hertz or something like that, uh, then you, know, you, have to, you, you have to be a little bit careful with interpreting the strain information of what's physically happening when you get down into the static realm. I'm looking forward to, to some technological advancements on the interrogator technology so that we don't have to worry about that and we don't have to do this high pass component of our filtering where we can keep all the way down to DC. That would, that would change the game. So I saw Roger Crickmore, uh, some, other, uh, some other DAS developers. So we wanna see static stream. Okay, thank you. So Wagahat Nassar asked, uh, how would the depth of the in-depth inlay fiber optic cable change the result? Yeah, that, that's a that's a very good question. Um, I have, if you could give me a second to pull up another figure, that would be, uh, let me do that. All right, so do you see my uh, Adobe Acrobat document? No, no, yet. I do not. I think you have to share your screen again. And I apologize. I think we weren't seeing oh, your yeah. trench picture, but you had oh, a great description. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I forgot I stopped my share. I'll go back for Nate. Uh, on that one. But do you see it now? Adobe Acrobat. Yes, there's a box right in the middle of it. So I don't know if you can. Okay, yeah. Yep. yep. All yeah, good so now. This is the kind of deformation that we typically see in the pavement. It's a basin. Um, there's also ways that uh, civil engineers inspect pavements by using what's something called a falling weight deflectometer. Um, and that falling weight creates a basin. And in that basin, we have a compression zone and we have a tension zone that radiate away and that dies off with depth. Um, you can also look at this like a beam in bending and we wanna be above the neutral axis of bending so that we can best see our compression um, signature and then our tension as we get away. But this is kind of the the, the phenomenon that we mentioned. And this is a figure from our submitted paper, but I trust that you won't share. So Peter, and, and I do have a question for that. So what would be the, the, the depth that you would recommend to trench the fiber on the paper? Yeah, it, as shallow as possible, as long as you can keep the fiber safe. So it depends on your cable. And if you are very comfortable with the armoring and the ability of your cable to survive the vibratory compaction process, which is the, the point in the fiber's life where it's under the most stress and the, the, the biggest chance of failure, um, that's the depth you should go. So we went with the 3.175 centimeter depth, which worked out very well, but we tested that with our cable and with uh, our test setups where we had small amounts of asphalt and a vibratory compactor with the right amount of energy to see if our cable would survive. Um, so, so ideally as, as surficial, as, sur as towards the surface as you possibly can get. For Nate, the, uh, the trench that I was mentioning is this right here. You can see the disturbed soil that's right next to the road. Um, and this is where Ronan was walking. So when, when she was walking on this trench, the, the trenched cable could pick up both the car and the pedestrian. 
whereas the cable in the road could not easily see the pedestrian due to the impedance contract. I have a question and I, I don't think I'm allowed to, I can't type it anywhere uh, for some reason. So um, I was wondering, uh, is this still in place? And like, what is the survivability of this um, over time? Yeah, so it's a multi-purpose uh, research project. We're also looking at the degradation of pavement over time. And on uh, one side of that pavement is where all of the garbage trucks for the UC Berkeley campus and housing facilities are stored. So every day, um, I think like 150 dump trucks drive over that road, both empty and loaded. Um, so every day we have, well, we have a camera that's recording all of the vehicles that go over, but we also can extrapolate based on the typical load due to the dump trucks. It's kind of the only vehicles that go over the road. And then we look at the strain change in the pavement using Brayon technology, which I mentioned can do very, very long-term absolute strain change. Uh, and, and the cables are all still perfectly healthy and uh, it's working extremely well. And it was installed midsummer last summer. Wow, that's great. We, we, we have, uh, we can open, we have a few more minutes, so we can open this for both questions for uh, Peter and Meg. And I would like to start asking, so what is the future of DAS in engineering infrastructure? Where do you see or what are your next set of projects? Either one. Would you like to go, Meg? Well, we're in a roll. I'll let you go first and I'll, I'll say anything that you don't cover, <laughs> but I'm happy to talk. Um, um, one thing that uh, I'm, I'm very much interested in is monitoring uh, geotechnical properties over time. Um, so two projects come to mind. One is um, consolidation surcharge loading. So we can put fiber vertically in soil column based on either um, a drill rig or a CPT, we can push fiber vertically and couple it with the surrounding soil with a um, cementitious bentonite grout. And then we can look at how the shear wave velocity of the soil changes, as well as how the strain in the soil changes using multiple fiber optic techniques. So if this is at a site where we have to surcharge load and put a large embankment on the ground to consolidate the, the clay, specifically in the San Francisco Bay Area, we have to consolidate the clay and a certain amount of time has to pass before we can remove that surcharge and get on with construction. And time is, is money. So if we can come up with a way to assess the consolidation uh, progress and process based on shear wave velocity increase, and strain due to the actual consolidation settlement, we may be able to reduce the amount of time that that uh, surcharge has to sit at that site. Um, so that's, that's one project that comes to mind. Another project that comes to mind is with the California Energy Commission. They're uh, very interested in quantifying liquefaction risk of natural gas pipelines. And it, one of the most important thing, if the most important thing with liquefaction risk is the water table location. So if we can use uh, either dark fiber or uh, purposefully installed fiber to constantly monitor or periodically monitor the location of the water table using geophysical methods, we can create accurate risk predictions for how natural gas pipelines will perform in the event of an earthquake. Um, so, so those are two things that we're working on that are involved with DAS. I do think it is important to incorporate DAS uh, into a comprehensive monitoring plan and a protocol either with other fiber optic sensing technologies or uh, especially for civil infrastructure, you need redundancy in, in, in monitoring. Oh, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with um, what Peter's talking about. Obviously a lot of our research focused on that long-term studies because if people are gonna invest a lot of money in a sensor and in installation, they wanna know, is it gonna work for a long time and how well will it work over time? Um, and that relates to, you know, soil properties, everything, overall performance with time, because it is an upfront investment. And we have time-tested point sensors. So going back to what Peter talked about, I think DOS or other fiber optic sensors, DTS, DSS, are part of a holistic instrumentation approach. Um, it can connect the dots in between point sensors, using point sensors as the anchors for a lot of the reading readings and using DOS to extrapolate in between. So I hope to see DOS used more that way. 
Um, a lot of what I think Peter's trying to do and what I'm trying to do and what Dante is trying to do and what Herb's trying to do is get the civil engineering community more uh, comfortable with the technology so that we can start using it for infrastructure monitoring um, in more ways. And kind of thinking about the, the, minimum, the minimal viable use for the technology so that it can get installed and then we can do a lot more fun researchy stuff once it is installed. But those are, those are some of the thoughts on my mind. Um, so, uh, and one Krell, Krell thing. So we are, we are talking about like using it in ice or to detect, detect ice thickness, as well as um, we have a permafrost tunnel. So we're looking at, can we use this to monitor permafrost as well? We have a couple of more questions from the, on the site, so Andres Chavarria, uh, he's a vendor of uh, interrogator units. So he's curious about if there are specific issues with dust sensors that the companies need to address. Uh, so this is asking about where they should focus their expertise and effort to be able to solve, address some of the problems that we may find in the engineering infrastructure. So. You know, for example, he's asking is sensitivity and spatial resolution where we need the, we need to, to put the emphasis on. Yeah, it, it's a great question. Um, my main answer to that is versatility. Um, civil engineers need the ability to change the parameters of their uh, data acquisitions on a custom case by case basis. So the more variability that you have and the more power that you give the user uh, the better. So first of all, understanding the technology, which is key. So being transparent with technological information as much as you feel comfortable with. Also making things like variable gauge length, variable readout, ways to control the amount of data that is being generated, um, removing uh, instrument drift so that we can uh, be completely DC coupled uh, and, and reducing the, uh, the interrogator noise. Um, I think just those things are decade, if not two. Of, uh, of development. So uh, uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Andres, for the question. So Doug Miller has another a comment uh, that for water table uh, proximity applications, uh, not only does should be considered, but also DTS might be a, a good modality to be combined with. Yeah, the, see, DTS, we need to be vertical in order, for, um, in order to really be able to tell you the depth of the water table. So if we're talking mm -hmm. about um, a practical installation where we put a fiber in the trench of a pipe, for example, uh, where we, it, we're basically not adding anything to the installation cost. We're just throwing a fiber into a pipe with the natural gas pipeline when it's put in, or a water pipeline for that matter. Um, DTS can tell us about leaks, uh, but it, it have a hard time with the depth to water table. So, um, but we don't have any more questions on the side. So I want to continue what we, Meg just said about the community become more familiar with the techniques. And yes, these interrogators are expensive, but I know I, I have seen that Brady Cox was in this meeting earlier, and uh, he's leading the effort of trying to buy a, a, an interrogator for the Neri side at University of Texas Austin. And so the community will be able to write proposals to NSF and use this type of equipment. On top of that, there are many of the data has been acquired in the last, 10 years that they're available for anybody to use. And, the, and this RCN is working on different workshop, including workshop in which we can have training about how to analyze and interpret the data. So the Professor Wang is, is leading that effort. And so uh, please check our website because there are going to be information about those type of events coming up. And we also have regular meetings, regular webinars, not only application for uh, engineering, but also application to uh, uh, geophysical and near surface and geological application of us. So you are also invited to participate on those events. Um, so, uh, Dr. Wang, am I missing anything? Casey, I'm missing anything? Oh, this okay. seems perfect. Okay. Just uh, be sure that you're signed up for the DAS RCN mailing list if you haven't already. Uh, so you have notices of all of these events. Yeah. Uh, Peter, maybe I could ask you uh, a question because you've brought up 
this uh, industry uh, organization for uh, FOSA. And uh, what I'm wondering is how much more research uh, do you think might be needed in order to get uh, more purpose laid fiber, say in roads? I can imagine that if you made it a Department of Transportation requirement that all federal funds for highways uh, incorporate DAS, that in addition to the dark fiber, in which the uh, uh, installation can be very uncertain, uh, instead you'd have some kind of uniform uh, fiber network. That, that is what is absolutely needed. Uh, but the question from the research community is what is a practical way to do a purposeful installation? You know, putting it in the asphalt is really great research topic. And I, I think it has a lot of promise, but no, no governmental organization or contractor really at this stage would be comfortable with that because there's a lot of liability questions and there's a lot of speciality that comes with fiber optics. You know, it's not your everyday person that knows how to strip and splice an armor tightly buffered cable. So you, 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 there, there needs to be um, a, a gradual development towards that that is led by researchers who are finding realistic ways to purposefully introduce fiber into infrastructure systems. Um, I personally have found, we have a dark fiber array on the, the UC Berkeley campus. Um, and we, we interrogate that for uh, seismological purposes. It's extremely difficult to index and it's extremely difficult to know what's going on. So we need to, in my opinion, have purposeful installations where we know about the cable, we know about the geometry, we know about the coupling to the infrastructure system. But I think it's not on, it's not at the stage of lobbying yet. It's at the stage of researchers coming up with, um, with, with set recommendations that you know, over the next five years or so, everybody's on the same page and then you go forward with the lobbying. There are lobbying organizations out there that are, that are pushing uh, to, include dark, uh, to include conduit fiber next to pipelines. And that is a great start. Um, but the utility of that for civil infrastructure monitoring is not well-defined yet. So thank you. There are a couple of more comments or questions on the, on the question and answer uh, page. So, uh, Dominiki uh, Asimaki ask, uh, makes a comment, uh, a good point about the water table, although she will argue that on an infrastructure system scales, our geotechnical liquefaction method developed for, for site-specific pro uh, problems are highly uncertain. And she says that as a community may want to rethink how to use distributed monitoring system like us to develop liquefaction risk assessment methodology to reduce uncertainty whether it comes from water table measurement, properties, et cetera. Yeah, from my perspective, the main goal of using measurements in water table location is to just reduce uncertainty in models that already exist. So we have a, a large suite of models that are already out there. Several come to mind that are, are based on the proximity to uh, water, based on water table depth, geologic unit, et cetera, but they require a lot of uh, spatial assumptions. And we assume a water table depth over, uh, over an area and we give it an epistemic, we give it an uncertainty and we wanna reduce that uncertainty because as we propagate that through to like fragility curves and modeling these infrastructure systems, that's a huge source of uncertainty. So if we can reduce the uncertainty based on actual measurements, uh, then, then utilities would be more inclined to actually use these models. Because right now, I hate to say it, but it's a lot of a lot of we're generating models, we're generating ways that utilities should uh, use their infrastructure, but they have their ways and they're already set in how they want to assess their own risks. Um, and, and it's up to us to make the argument for why you should basically do what, 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 we're, what we're doing, what we're pushing. So, um, uh, finally, Mike Willie indicates that uh, asked, what is the maintenance cycle for asphalt light? And how would the fiber be handled from that? Yeah, that's a tough one. So this, this um, pavement was resurfaced in 2007, and then we resurfaced it in 2020. So that's 13 years. Um, and the actual, what we did in this case, what was just added another course on top. But if you're going to have to grind down and remove an asphalt layer, 
you'd want to make sure your fiber is deeper than that, than that. So you need to plan for maintenance well ahead of time, taking into account the, the installation from the get-go, because otherwise, you know, it, you could, you could run into a lot of extra cost if you need to grind up an asphalt with a steel reinforced cable on the inside of it, that could be very difficult. So these are all questions that are really important. Okay. So I think I'm on to, to call the meeting. Uh, thank you very much for all the questions. I would like to point out also that Brady Cox just put a comment on the chat and a website that you can get information about the system that the that, uh, 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 University of Texas is buying for to be able to use DAS by the community. So I think that that is a good development for our engineering infrastructure community. Um, please let me thank, everybody thanks Peter and, and Meg for very interesting presentations. Um, please don't forget to join in our mainly list and be able to, to participate on, on the, all the activities that we are doing in this uh, RCM, okay? So thank you very, very, very much, Meg, Peter, and uh, we are signing off. Thank you. Thank you.